to introduce Jeff Motes. Jeff is the director of the West Central Regional Center of FPAN, or the Florida Public Archaeology Network. He earned a master's in history and historical archaeology archaeology and a bachelor's in anthropology from the University of West Florida. Jeff's work experiences prior to FPAN include employment as a field tech and crew chief for archaeological consultants down in Sarasota, as well as an underwater archaeologist for the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research and as a museum curator at the Florida Maritime Museum at Cortez. Today, Jeff is going to share with us about shipwrecks from the Civil War period and the great diversity of ships found in those maritime battles, including highlights of examples of Civil War-related shipwrecks right here in the Tampa Bay area. So please, everyone, join me in welcoming Jeff Motes. Thank you. Is it on? Thank you. It's on. It's on. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Um, Great to be here. Last time I was here was a long time ago, so it's great to be back. Um, appreciate such a great crowd and a beautiful day. The only better thing I can imagine is if we were giving this talk out on a boat, out on the water or something like that. So uh, happy to be here. Um, March is Florida Archaeology Month, and uh, so it's a, a gr another good reason why we're talking about archaeology and some shipwrecks and about some shipwrecks here. Um, this year's theme, each year we have a different theme, and this year's theme is uh, heritage at risk. And uh, um, you don't necessarily think about shipwrecks right off the bat when you're considering, you know, which of these heritage sites that are so important to us um, are at risk. But they, uh, once they stabilize in this marine environment or wherever they're at, um, they slowly start to decay. And so shipwrecks are at risk. Um, at risk with you know the changing underwater environments that we're experiencing now but also at risk from uh, um, collecting and looting and just people going out enjoying themselves and, and grabbing a piece to take home with them and that that's what often happens with shipwrecks so um, keep that in the back of your mind that's part of kind of what we're going to be talking about a little bit today and the reason that I have this first slide up uh, Florida's underwater archaeological preserves is, is one of the shipwrecks that we'll talk about today is, was the last one that was dedicated as part of the preserve system. And this is a, a, a public archaeology management system, a way to manage these shipwreck sites to encourage people to go visit shipwrecks, to learn about these local histories, to learn about what they're associated with, um, and enjoy them as a park in their own backyard. And that's what these places are, and it, and it really tells us a lot about kind of who we are and who, who our community is, and, 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 and we want to encourage more people to go out and experience that sort of stuff. So before I get going on the shipwreck um, aspects of this presentation, I want to give just really briefly kind of who we are, the Florida Public Archaeology Network. Um, so I'll run through that really quickly. That's my name down at the bottom. I work out of the University of South Florida, but we operate a regional center of the Florida Public Archaeology Network. We're a statewide network. We were established about 12 years ago, and we were set up um, to do a lot of public engagement opportunities and programming. Um, we aren't a, a, an organization that's set up to do research. We don't do contract archaeology. What we do is this. Um, we set up programming, work, work with lots of partners throughout the state, and encourage people to learn more about archaeology and Florida's unique past and, and realize um, how these places really enrich our lives. You all are here on a Sunday afternoon, a beautiful day, could be doing anything, but you come to Heritage Village because this is a really neat place to come to and learn about the past. So all of these places work hand in hand in, in telling us a little bit more about the Florida that we know and that we love to visit and that we love to live. Um, we're a, a regional network, we're a network of regions, um, eight uh, across the state. Each region is set up 
um, with a cluster of counties that we provide outreach services, education and outreach services to, um, all sorts of different organizations, local governments. We even uh, work with and assist the Division of Historical Resources up in Tallahassee and any of their uh, uh, issues um, that, they, that may arise with archaeological sites and archaeological management and that sort of stuff. Um, I'm based here at uh, USF and, and we operate two regional centers, the West Central Regional Center and the Center and the Central Regional Center that's based up at Crystal River Archaeological State Park. If you guys haven't been there yet, I highly recommend it. It's another uh, one of our great places that you can go to and learn about uh, a really unique aspect of Florida's past. Um, we're at a program of the University of West Florida and these are the other host institutions um, that operate within this network, USF, Florida Atlantic University, and, and Flagler College over on the East Coast. So we do all sorts of things. Um, and we operate best through, through our partnerships with various organizations throughout these regions. Um, the way we're set up is we don't have a place that we can gather this many folks to come talk about archaeology till we're blue in the face, so we got to go out and do it. Um, we put gas in our vehicles and get to these places throughout our regions. So we operate with, within 18 counties of, of Florida, um, so it's quite a lot, and we rely in big part on our partnerships um, that we're able to kind of create and, and foster over the years. Um, and we work through a, an engagement mantra that a little bit of uh, education leads to some understanding and appreciation and ultimately to a point where um, folks are, will say to themselves, well, what can I do to make a difference um, to try to ensure that this really unique place, this place that I love, that's so dear to me, you know, will stick around for another hundred years or so. What can we do to help preserve some of these places in Florida? So ultimately, that's, that's what we're kind of around for, um, is to really encourage participation, but then also, what are the decisions that we all can make um, to enrich other people's lives with, with these unique places that, that uh, are right here in our backyards? Um, and there's, a, there's a, a big economic impact to that too. In 2007, 2008, there was a study undertaken just to see what kind of effect historic tour, heritage tourism, historic preservation in the state of Florida has. What kind of role does it play economically as far as an impact to the state's bottom line? And what they were able to realize is that just about $4.2 billion is brought into the state, into the state's bottom line, directly because of heritage tourism. And this is, you know, a piece of that. This place is a part of that. And so are the shipwrecks that we're going to talk about today. Um, but there's also an aspect to these places that I think we all know and, and enjoy is that it's not just the dollars and cents or the economic impact, but it really does um, play a part in our lives as far as community aesthetics and character preservation and really gives us a sense of place and who we are and where we want to be and, and who was here before us. Um, so it gives us a good idea of what was going on in a place that maybe we're new to or maybe we've lived here for our entire lives. Um, so down on the bottom here, and this is the next slide, and this is the one that I want to start with. Uh, this is the shipwreck site of the USS Narcissus. Narcissus is a Civil War uh, related shipwreck that we have in Tampa Bay. And this was picture day out there back in 2006 um, when a, a, a contractor with the Department of Defense was working on some new side scan sonar uh, uh, um, remote sensing apparatus um, and they decided to uh, kind of jump on board with the archaeologists who were doing Tampa Bay shipwreck sur survey out of the Florida Aquarium. So they had the dive group with the Florida Aquarium. Archaeologists were working with them under a, a, a grant from the Division of Historical Resources and got with this uh, DOD contractor and so they pulled a side scan sonar and a magnetometer, and I'll show a little picture of those, um, back and forth over the shipwreck site for a day and uh, got some good pictures. This is the height of technology in 2006. The stuff that you see today, only about, what, 12 years later, is like, um, you know, it puts this in the dust. Like, it, it, this is junk compared to what they do today. And I wish I had some better remote sensing pictures from the USS Narcissus, but this is a really interesting one because what you can see, it's not a big site, and we'll get into kind of the, the details of the shipwreck. It's not a big site, but what you can see, is there a laser here? I bet it's the red button on the right, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, all right. So uh, this is uh, the engine frame that used to house the uh, upstand, the single um, 
vertical uh, cylinder for the, the steam engine that the tugboat ran. Um, so that's it laying over on its side. This is a bunch of boiler pieces and boiler parts that kind of remain out on the site. This is the propeller shaft that leads to the stern assembly and the propeller and what remains of the propeller here. Anybody tell me what this might be? How about you, man? What does it look like? Yeah, this is a Goliath grouper that showed up for picture day. Uh, about six foot long. I've been to this site. I usually visit this site about three times a year with either some training dives with local divers or we go out just to do some monitoring or whatnot. And there's about four or five of these that live on this shipwreck site. And this ship, when it was running, was only about 80 feet long. So the shipwreck site itself is not big. And these things, they call it their home. Um, and it's almost like, you know, there's like tree scratching posts in the woods where you can see bears kind of rubbing their bums up against it. Well, that's exactly what these guys do to these shipwreck parts. So when we talk about kind of threatened at risk, you know, um, there's some natural causes to all that too. And if you've ever, how many divers are out there? Anybody dive? So if you've ever been in the water and you've been near a Goliath grouper and they don't want you there, they let you know that they don't want you there. They have this way of this, like creating this bass drum, like sonic boom underwater. And it really, it's frightening. It scares the crap out of you. Especially if visibility is only three or four feet and you can't see that much in front of your face. And then you hear this whoop. Um, it's pretty frightening. But so anyways, um, that's mama bear there, showed up for picture day. Here's a, a over, overview. You can really see the size of her, but these are the pieces that are out there, and this is the relief that's off the bottom. Um, this is a really great site to be included as an underwater archaeological preserve. It's only in about 14 feet of water, so it's really accessible to experienced divers and novice divers as well. She's about two miles offshore of, of Mullet Key and uh, is a great fishing site. There's a lot of other marine life out there, not just these Goliath grouper and whatever they're eating. Um, but there's lots of bait fish and snapper and, and uh, gag grouper and all kinds of, it's a, it's a destination um, in kind of a, a, you know, a, a, a sea where there's not a lot of relief off the bottom. So this is a good place to kind of hide out. Um, so here, here's the Narcissus again. You've seen that image. That's a picture of a diver looking, kind of working on the back end of the stern assembly here. Um, the propeller shaft looking forward. So that's what left of what's left of um, one of the propeller blades there. So we'll kind of get into it a little bit. These are the uh, remote sensing gear that's, that's uh, uniformly kind of applied when archaeologists and underwater archaeologists are looking for shipwreck sites. Um, it's not always easy to find them. The sea is vast. Um, there's, you know, not always an X marks the spot unless you're looking at Spanish galleon shipwrecks. Then um, those were mapped pretty well by the colonial Spaniards and, and those maps survive. Um, but a shipwreck like this is, is really difficult to find and so what archaeologists rely on is remote sensing gear like this but then also word of mouth. Because when uh, scuba diving became a sensation back in the 60s and 70s people went out and looked for things like this. And in the Tampa Bay area this particular shipwreck has been known about for a long time. So the first thing that the archaeologists and the divers with the Florida Aquarium did was go talk to some of those sport divers that are well known in the community and figure out where these sites might be. And then you can go and refine your research and refine your searches using some of these. So this is a, uh, up here in the upper left is a magnetometer. This is a, uh, a, a, a metal detector basically. It picks up uh, ferrous anomalies that are a little different from the ambient kind of uh, magnetic signature that the earth gives off. So whenever that particular device runs over a big metal piece or a big metal item, it kind of kicks it off uh, the readout and you can see that there was obviously something down there. Sub bottom profiler is going to send radar signals through the bottom and actually tell you what's under what may be buried underneath the seafloor. And then a side scan sonar gives you a good picture of what may be up above the seafloor. So it sends out sonar waves and when they bounce back, that's what gives you a good kind of readout. Um, and that's that image that I was showing before that was taken from a side scan sonar. Uh, so the USS Narcissus um, 
it ended up in Tampa Bay, but never really saw any action during the Civil War in Tampa Bay. Um, she was a tugboat that was built in Albany, New York in 1863 um, and was built for inner harbor service um, in New York Harbor, not for military service in the Civil War and naval campaigns of the Civil War. Um, so the, the United States Navy really had kind of a task um, not only to build their Navy up during the Civil War and at the outset of the Civil War, but then maintain that Navy as, um, as the war kind of uh, went on. Um, the major, uh, I guess, naval strategy that was employed by the North on the South was this thing called the blockade. And this was a strategy developed by General Winifred Scott. Went and went, he went and petitioned um, President Lincoln and said, this is something that we've got to employ. And it ended up being um, quite a divisive strategy for the, the, the United States Army and Navy. Um, and what it basically did was set up a blockade of ships all throughout and around the southern ports, basically to uh, make sure there weren't any things coming in and coming out. And it was very, very successful. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the at the beginning of the war, at the outset of the war, the Union Navy consisted of about 80 boats. Um, not a huge navy, but one that was being built and kind of and and uh, you know strengthened as the years went on. Um, but to counteract you know the rebellion down south, they really had to increase that, and especially with this strategy of the blockade. So by the end of the war, you can see that that number. Um, uh, really just escalated, you know, just really went uh, through the roof. It's a, it's a word that I made up. It's called octrupled. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that before. But from 80 to about 671 in a, just a couple of years. So that means that they were commissioning just about any boat that was built during that time into service into the Civil War. Hence, that's why we have such a diversity of boats um, and it's really exemplified by, you know, the one that's wrecked right out here in, in Tampa Bay, or outside of Tampa Bay. Uh, a little tugboat, 80 foot long, um, was not a military vessel, but it was employed and, and, and used during the Civil War. And you can see just through this kind of, um, ex, you know, this little bit of data that I extracted for, for this presentation that um, shows that exports of cotton to England were 816 million pounds um, and went down to six million pounds in the first two years of the Civil War. So the blockade was quite successful. And of course, um, as the war was getting started, there wasn't as much attention being paid um, to you know, really generating a lot of cotton, but still there wasn't a lot of materials going in and out of the ports during the Civil War. So that blockade um, really, really provided a good basis and a, good, uh, a, a big benefit for the United States Navy. Um, so the, the Narcissus was launched in 1863 in Albany, New York, launched as Mary Cook. Um, she was a wooden hulled screw tug with an inverted direct acting single head overhead steam, single overhead uh, steam engine. She was only about 81 and a half feet long, um, 18 feet wide and about nine f or eight feet deep. Um, so not a really, really big boat and one single boiler. Uh, and one furnace. So those are some of the pieces that we saw in the, the site plan or in that imagery. Um, as soon as she hit the water, was com commissioned by the United States Navy and renamed USS Narcissus. This is not a picture of Narcissus, but it's a similar boat during the same time or thereabouts. And um, what we know that Narcissus was armed with during the war um, was one 20-pound Parrot rifle and a, and a heavy 12-pounder. These are land cannons. These are, these are guns that you would put in a battlefield, and they strapped them to the deck of this little small boat, this 80-foot boat. So they had to put a lot of sacrificial planking on the deck in front of the wheelhouse and everything um, just to really kind of try to take care. And, and if you look, you can see these lines that are lashed to whatever on the deck just to kind of hold it in place. I can't imagine being a sailor on this boat trying to manhandle one of these things, especially if they had to fire it. So Narcissus was put to service in the East Gulf, East Gulf Blockading Squadron, and she was commissioned to work in Mobile Bay. And that's where, from 1863 until the end of the war, that's where she saw service and her crew serviced. Um, they were part of a, I may have this wrong, but I think there was about 16 or so boats that was employed just in Mobile Bay. 
Um, there were a few skirmishes and whatnot, but then a lot of hazards throughout the bay that the Confederates would just leave out there. And this is a, a keg torpedo or kind of a Confederate torpedo um, that would just, you know, be kind of anchored out in the water. Narcissus ran up against one of these one time and blew a hole in the starboard side and sunk in 16 feet of water. They were able to float Narcissus, get her over to Pensacola to be refitted, and then bring her back into service before the end of the war. So she did see some action, um, but from what most of the military records really talk about is, is Narcissus was utilized kind of as a communication or kind of dispatch vessel going back and forth between the other boats, um, but was still armed, you know, was still uh, uh, commissioned into military service. So the story of how she ended up out, out offshore of Tampa Bay um, begins at the end of the war. She was decommissioned on January 1st, 1866, and sent packing, more or less. Um, the crew started from Pensacola, where the boat and the crew were supplied for a pretty long journey. They were going to steam around the Florida Peninsula and then head back um, to New York Harbor, by all accounts, um, to be then put back into private service and go back into being what she was really built for, was an inner harbor tug. Um, she was there with uh, USS Althea, which was another tugboat, similar tugboat, um, that was, they steamed together from Pensacola. And just a couple days after January 1st, made it close to Tampa Bay, and there was an increasing gale, probably a really nasty cold front coming across the Gulf at that time. The two captains uh, didn't have a lot of knowledge uh, or intimate knowledge of Tampa Bay, the waters, the bar, getting into the, the bay. Um, and there was thought to try to get around the backside of Egmont Key, excuse me, um, to try to wait out the storm. But because they really didn't have um, knowledge of the bay, they decided to wait it off offshore, wait it out offshore. Both boats um, sailed a little ways offshore of Egmont Key and uh, deployed anchors and kept their engines running full steam. Althea was a little further west than Narcissus was. Um, and at some point during the night of January 4th, 1866, um, both boats were really getting hammered by wind and waves coming out of the west and probably northwest in an increasing gale. And uh, Narcissus ran aground, shot off a distress flare that the crew of the Althea recorded in their ship's log and then also replied back with an appropriate flare. And then there wasn't another flare, but there was um, something lit up the sky, and it was recorded in the, in the Althea notes, and what it likely was was an explosion on board Narcissus. Um, what had probably happened was there, run aground, waves and water kind of breaching over the vessel, and uh, got down into that engine room that was likely running really, really hot. That cold January water probably hit the boiler, and everything exploded and really tore out, again, the starboard side of the boat. So the next morning, when the crew of the Althea, and there was daylight, um, Narcissus was turned over completely, belly, belly side up. Um, and uh, there was wreckage, and unfortunately, uh, bodies of sailors that were strewn all along Mullet Keys and Egmont Key. They were able to recover the body of one of the individuals, um, but the ship and the crew were a total loss. And there was 26 men aboard at the time that she went down. So that's how she ended up off of Tampa Bay. Been there ever since 1866, and this was a popular dive site um, for sport divers back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and uh, had a pretty good idea of, of what vessel this was and, and what she was doing there. Um, and you know, pieces and parts and were picked up and are in the garages or on mantelpieces or whatnot, kind of all throughout Tampa Bay, and that was one of the tasks that the Florida Aquarium and the archaeologists really wanted to try to document. And so they were able and they were invited to come see some of the things. Um, but the other task was really to document the shipwreck site and, and what was left of, of the vessel there. So it's only in about 14 feet of water and you can see that here's the engine remains kind of le leaning over onto its port side, um, the propeller shaft, what's left of the prop or the propeller, and then a lot of uh, machinery and boiler fragments kind of out here to the south and the east a little bit. But this isn't a really big site. This is uh, from here, the bottom of the engine, where the transmission was, um, to the propeller shaft. It's only about maybe 15 feet, so not very big at all. Um, but a really unique dive site because of all the marine life. It's really close to shore. Um, it's a good place to kind of go out and do some fishing and even some snorkeling as well. 
Um, so just kind of going through some pictures on this one. Here's the engine, you know, again, leaning over on its side. This is the top of the cylinder here, looking back towards the bottom of the engine. An archaeologist sketch. Um, when we go down and record these things underwater, you know, we're just taking uh, thin pieces of mylar, which is uh, just plastic that we can write on with a number two pencil. Um, so again, not the, the height of technology, um, but it's good for working underwater and lots of rulers and figuring out what's what um, that way so we can document what's down there at a certain time and then bring it back. And so we'll always have a record of that documentation and we can see the changes that are slowly occurring out at the site. Um, just some close-ups of some fasteners. Here's the propeller. Uh, the propeller, I believe it was a three-bladed propeller. I can't remember if it's three or four, but one's sticking in the ground here, one's up, and then the other one was probably knocked off. Um, but this is, uh, um, it's, a, it's a really dynamic environment out there. Um, she's located just on the north side of the big shipping channel to the north of Egmont Key. So it's an area called the Egmont Shoals. Um, and before that shipping channel was in there, it was probably a really shoaly, kind of hazardous area for you to uh, run boats in and out. Um, and it remains that way today. The, the channel is maintained, so that's always going to be a a major influence on all the sedimentation and just how things get moved around out there. Um, but even this particular site, it's not far from the channel, but I'll go out, you know, in, in January or February and then three months later it'll look completely different because there'll be four feet more sand on top of it or four feet less, more, less sand on top of it. Um, so it's an environment that's constantly changing and that's uh, really good that we're able to monitor it on a regular basis to see what are the kind of the natural and environmental influences that are um, either helping to preserve this place or kind of uh, degrading it a little faster. So um, the management decisions, of course, rest uh, with the Division of Historical Resources and the Bureau of Archaeological Research, the archaeologists that are up in Tallahassee, um, what we may need to do, you know, if, if we need to recover anything or kind of preserve things in place. But here's uh, an old ship, an old ship plan, or an old shipwreck plan. Um, we we desperately need to go out and update this. And this summer, we're going to get out and do some photogrammetry work on it, um, where we take about a thousand pictures and then stitch them all together, and it creates a really nice 3D model. So a year from now, I should have a much more uh, 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 accurate and updated shipwreck plan for this particular one. Um, but here again, it's the engine works, the propeller and the propeller shaft and the stern assembly of the boat, and then a lot of boiler fragments out here. I think this is one, nope. Um, anyways, that was the, the last shipwreck to be included in the uh, shipwreck preserve system. It was dedicated in 2015. The Florida Aquarium, the Florida Aquarium staff wrote the nomination um, that was ultimately approved by the Department of State and then dedicated as part of this particular shipwreck uh, preserve system. There's another one in our neck of the woods um, that's not affiliated with the Civil War, but I threw it in here anyways. This is a sugar barge down off of Bradenton Beach, also known as Regina. I did my checkout dive in 1996 on this boat. Um, and this is just a neat uh, shipwreck story. Not much of a ship was really a barge at the time carrying a bunch of molasses from Havana um, and would get a uh, drug up and, up and down the Gulf from Havana to New Orleans ended up on uh, March 1940, lost its towing cable, and ended up on the beach of Bradenton Beach. And there were six men aboard um, the boat when she was ran aground. And it was at night. Um, all the locals heard them hooting and hollering out there. The waves were nasty, so they didn't want to jump off and swim to shore. So they lit fires, the locals lit fires on the beach before they could, you know, daylight broke so they could get either Coast Guard cutters or whatnot to come out. Um, they got the Coast Guard from St. Petersburg to come out and uh, they flew, I think I got a picture of it, flew one of their planes over, tried to drop some life preservers, but each time they were washed over the boat. Um, the crew out there was getting impatient. There was a cook and a dog on board. Um, so then they got a cutter to come in, but they couldn't get in too close because it was nasty and really shallow. So they went around to the backside of Bradenton Beach and uh, uh, towed off the uh, rocket gun, got it over the the, the beach road there and fired out rope and each time the rocket on the rocket gun singed the rope. They did two attempts. So they couldn't get the rope out of there. So 
some local Cortez fishermen got in their rowboats, put their ropes in their, in their mouths, you know, bit it, and then rowed out there and saved, unfortunately, five of the six crew. The cook and his dog got impatient, and they jumped off, and they drowned on their way to the beach. Um, so not a total success, but still quite a harrowing story. This was dedicated in 2004 to be part of the shipwreck system. Um, and that gentleman right there, Mr. Adams, was part of the crew that saved, the, he was a fisherman from Cortez, and he was part of the crew that saved um, who was out there on the, on the shipwreck, the distressed vessel. Um, so anyways, another shipwreck, archeological preserve, underwater archeological preserve we have in our, in our area. And that's just a, a picture of Regina there when there's not a lot of sand through beach renourishment that's kind of covering up the boat. Um, so um, back to other Civil War related uh, uh, wrecks and, and supposed shipwrecks in the Tampa Bay area. So that's one, the USS Narcissus. And she really wasn't involved in any kind of skirmishes or any kind of Civil War pursuits for either the North or the South in Tampa Bay, just unfortunately ended up um, outside of, of Tampa Bay, outside the Egmont Shoals there. Um, but there's a, a couple other ships that do ha tell the story of kind of civil war in Tampa Bay. And these are Kate Dale and Scottish Chief. And, and uh, we know one of them is located on the Hillsborough River, but we thought we found the other one, but it turns out we didn't. So we're gonna kind of go through that story a little bit. And this is kind of the other side of that diversity theme on, you know, diversity of ship types that were employed during the Civil War. Um, this is on, this is kind of the, the profiteering side, not one that's necessarily employed for the North or the South, but these were boats that were part of a uh, 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 cattleman known as uh, James McKay and his crew. He owned these vessels and uh, he was able to um, basically kind of utilize uh, the problems that were occurring with the Civil War or related to the Civil War um, to kind of lift his profits during this particular time period. So he was kind of a profiteer, more or less, running cattle um, back and forth from the Bahamas and Cuba, and then bringing in arms and munitions to uh, help supply the southern side or some of the folks that were down here in Florida. During the Civil War, Florida was not you know, one that was uh, um, kind of at the epicenter, obviously, of a lot of the land skirmishes. I think there was about uh, maybe over a total of 400 skirmishes, Civil War-related skirmishes in Florida. The worst one we know about is the Battle of Olusti up in, up in the Panhandle. But down in Tampa Bay, the, the one that really kind of uh, uh, is recognized as probably the worst one in our area is the Battle of Ballast Point. And so that was a, a, a strategy by the blockaders who were stationed out at Egmont Key to try to sack James McKay's um, efforts there. So um, we'll kind of go through that story a little bit. So there's Narcissus. Here's Kate Dale, what remains of her. And what we thought was Scottish Chief a long time ago turns out isn't Scottish Chief. So she's still out there somewhere to be found. Um, and again, this was part of a, an effort by the Florida Aquarium and the Tampa Bay Shipwreck Survey. They worked on it for about four or five years in a row um, through grant money from the Division of Historical Resources, where they went out and uh, did some remote sensing on some of these places, recorded and documented, and then went to try to find some more uh, shipwrecks in the Tampa Bay area. And so a lot of this information comes from the work that the aquarium and the archaeologists that they employed did. So here he is, James McKay, um, a, uh, an important figure in Tampa Bay history. Um, and this is an 1850s military map of Southern Florida. Um, and it was something that the United States Navy, even though they had been stationed down in Key West for quite a long time, really didn't have a good idea of the, uh, the boundaries and the inlets and bays along Florida's southwest coast. But some of the early pioneers and settlers sure did. And James McKay was one of them. And so they ran that blockade quite often, so much that uh, the blockaders who were stationed out at Egmont Key were just sick and tired of it. So they, they hatched a plan to go up and try to burn his boats um, and, and get him when he was resupplying his boats on the Hillsborough River. So on uh, October, in October of 1862, they decided to put about 100 garrison soldiers on two boats um, and head up Tampa Bay from Egmont Key drop off those soldiers down at McKay Point, or uh, McKay Point? Gadsden Point, thank you, sorry. 
uh, Gadsden Point down here where the uh, Air Force Base is today, and then they would march the 14 miles or so kind of up the back side of where downtown Tampa Bay and everybody was kind of huddled in there. What they did as a diversionary tactic was sail the boats into um, Upper Hillsborough Bay and started lobbying cannon fire over the fort. Fort Brook was, was down there in downtown Tampa. Um, one of those uh, cannonballs ended up in uh, Oak Lawn Cemetery where the historic cemetery downtown Tampa is. So it would have been a, a, a pretty good shot for a cannon, but um, anyways, they were successful. The garrison soldiers, the soldiers marched up and uh, ambushed McKay and his men as they were, were uh, resupplying or kind of outfitting the, the three boats that were at the dock at his warehouse. And his warehouse is located on the Hillsborough River, just about where Lowry Park Zoo is today. Um, so the remains of Kate Dale can be seen there when it's clear water and kind of a low tide. Um, so they were successful. Scottish Chief Kate Dale and another boat called the Noise um, named after its owner, not because it was loud, um, were, were up there getting refitted and, and kind of resupplied to try to run the blockade. And so they were successful at, at kind of doing that. Um, and what they did was burn Kate Dale to the waterline. The records of the incident state that uh, McKay's men got Scottish Chief away from them, but after it had caught fire, but they started towing it or getting it down the river for some time to try to salvage that particular boat. Scottish Chief was a, a stern-wheeled steamboat, um, so probably a little bit more of a, a bigger investment for McKay than Kate Dale was. What we know about Kate Dale is she was a schooner rigged, maybe a two-masted vessel, um, sailing vessel, and so that one was burnt to the waterline, and these are some of the remains of Kate Dale that you can see today. So just some frames sticking out of the water here, some frame ends, and then uh, ceiling planking and hull planking to kind of sandwich it to make the hull of the vessel. And you can see just different pictures when the, the water clarity is nice, nice and good on a, on a sunny day. Um, the archaeologists wanted to make sure that this was Kate Dale that they were looking at, and so they um, decided to do a little bit of excavation and got all the proper, proper permitting and approvals to do so. Um, and uh, they weren't successful at finding uh, a, a mast step on the center line of the boat. Um, but they were successful in, in really kind of documenting what is seen as a, a sailing vessel. Not a lot of extra um, wood and substantial timbers down at the bottom that would have held together a, a steam assembly or a steam machine assembly. Um, so, so circumstantial evidence really points to that this is Kate Dale that's there. Also the kind of length overall, they know Kate Dale was about 80 feet long. Um, so a, a fairly sizable boat and especially sizable to get up the Hillsborough River at that time too. Another picture just of Kate Dale. And so the other question is where are the remains of Scottish Chief? So back in, oh, I forget when this was being done, probably back in 2010, this is a, a cutout from uh, the, the newspaper when they announced that they had found Kate Dale and Scottish Chief. Um, but unfortunately, what we can kind of see here, this is also a side scan sonar readout um, of the Hillsborough River, it, it, the water quality and clarity is not so great in the Hillsborough, so you need this remote sensing gear to really see. Um, what they saw here were two parallel sides that looks shipwrecky, and then a stern wheeled kind of axle down at the back end of the boat that also looks shipwrecky. Um, so it got ahead of them a little sooner than it did, then, then they were able to really go down and, and do some further analysis on it. Um, but Scottish Chief was about 140 feet long, and when they were able to go down in not great visibility and attach a tape to the back end here and up to where they assumed that it kind of just like disappeared into the sand here was about 141 feet. So all this evidence really pointed to, hey, we got a shipwreck here. But it turns out that this is uh, uh, the remains of a marine railway that's located on the Hillsborough River, so not a shipwreck. And I got some good images to kind of back that up. So Scottish Chief is still out there in the Hillsborough River somewhere. The river's been dredged so much that it's probably, if there's anything left of it, it's probably not a whole ship or a whole shipwreck like we see with Narcissus or even Kate Dale. Um, but there's still probably pieces of her somewhere. Um, so this is Lowry Park Zoo, and it's about two and a half, I think, river miles all the way down to where they suspect uh, Scottish Chief ended up. And this is from some really good documentary evidence from the incident. 
um, that she was floated down river to try to salvage what they could, but ultimately she sunk somewhere close to downtown Tampa. So this is 275 that goes over the river in downtown Tampa Bay. Um, here is the old waterworks and armature building. And that's right where they thought Scottish Chief was located. And, and so that's where they really um, uh, um, set up and tried to do a lot of remote sensing to, to, to see if they could find some remains of her. Um, what happens to be down there is, here's Waterworks Park today. Take a, a look at, and, and remember this notch in the river that's kind of built into the seawall. And it was there a long time ago too. Um, but this is, again, the Hillsborough River here, Blake High School, 275, and uh, the stretch of the river where they really thought um, Scottish Chief ended up and, and where this particular remains, this picture showed up. And it looks like a shipwreck, but this is perpendicular to kind of the river channel, right? It's not sitting up on the bank along the river channel parallel to it. Um, and what it ends up being, and, and archaeologists were sent back um, in 2014 ahead of some construction of the river walk that was expanded up the Hillsborough River from downtown Tampa. And they did some remote sensing again, and you can see that notch in the bank line um, that we paid attention to, and here's those parallel sides that kind of come out. I know you can't really see it, but then the, that transverse brace is just about right here um, that showed up, and in, in, I'll go back to it. So that's what we're looking at again is those parallel sides and that transverse brace. And here's an image, uh, an insurance map, a Sanborn insurance map, it's every historian's best friend, uh, from 1903 that shows Tampa Steamworks um, and what's remained of the Marine Railway that's there. And so Marine Ra Railway is, is an apparatus that you know, goes from a boathouse all the way down into the water where you can put a big boat on strap a big rope to it and tie it to a machine and a winch that pulls it up out of the water so you can work on the bottom of the boat. Well, that's what's there. Um, and this is a 1903 Sanborn map, and here's a 1915 that shows that they uh, um, added another marine railway in at some point. Um, but this is Tampa Steamworks that's located right there where Waterworks uh, Building is and, and Waterworks Park is today. So that's what we've got. Not a shipwreck, but we've got a really cool um, a historic feature of downtown Tampa, the Tampa Steamworks. So the Scottish Chief is still out there somewhere. And this has nothing to do with the Civil War, obviously. But um, still, it's good to report. Um, many of you, some of you guys might know the Florida Merchant Marine Survey and, and sketchbook of Philip Iyer Sawyer in, in 1938. Philip Iyer Sawyer was uh, employed by the Works Progress Administration to come down and record all the historic boats that were down here in the 1930s and um, as, as part of a, a WPA project. And uh, there were some unpublished sketches of his um, that didn't get published in the Historic American Merchant Marine Survey. It's a six volume book and each volume is about this big and it's just got an unbelievable kind of record of all of, of American historic boats. Um, this one was published uh, just a few years ago by the Florida Historical Quarterly. There's a man by the name of Dan Smith. He's retired from NASA, and he went back and was just in love with all these sketches. Well, anyways, this is a particular sketch in that reissued or in that, that volume that was published by the Florida Historical Quarterly, and it shows Tampa's steamways. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vision of Tampa's steamways because what they're showing here is a boat called the Gopher. Gopher is a famous archaeology boat. It was a, a boat that was owned by the Smithsonian and traveled up and down Florida's Gulf Coast and, and uh, got some of the first uh, documented documentary evidence um, of uh, some of our prehistoric sites. And then this is Tarpon. Both of these boats probably weren't in Tampa at the same time, um, but Philip Sawyer put them in there anyways. But it's a Tampa Steamworks. It's the same image from those Sanborn maps. And we got one marine railway here and another one here. Um, that's coming down, so just a, a neat image to kind of show. Uh, let's see, so that's, those are the boats, those are the Civil War boats, uh, or kind of the remains of a few, a couple Civil War boats here in Tampa Bay. Um, this is uh, just a, a, an excerpt from a, a book called The uh, Ships and Shipwrecks in the Americas, and it's really a great piece. Um, I don't know if it's in the library here, but it, it's, a, it's a great book to own. And uh, this particular section on the Civil War was written by Gordon Watts, who's one of the foremost um, uh, Civil War historians 
uh, shipwreck and uh, underwater archaeologist, um, and it's just a really good section of the book, so I highly recommend it. Um, and that's where you can get a lot of information, and especially on this theme of, you know, this was the dawn of kind of uh, iron and engineering, and really testing out new, new, uh, um, new and different ways of of uh, conducting naval warfare. Um, so, anyways, uh, that's about all I got. Um, thanks for listening. I know I was all over the place with this particular one, but appreciate your time. Thank you.